Okay, everyone, we're sorry we're getting started a little bit late. We've been having some technical difficulties. Uh, so it's going to be able to work, but you may be hearing your presenters, if the slides aren't turning, when they want them to say slides, so somebody in the back can actually get them to work. So uh, it's working, but it's not working the way it normally does. So we're getting started just a hair late. My name is Beth Wright Smith. I'm your, your MC this morning. It is still morning, isn't it? And yeah, barely. Uh, so, so we've got a, a packed group. We're, we're very happy to have all of you here. We're so happy all of you have come. We try and tell people if you've already had a safety seminar in the past this year, you can still come to ours because we generally have some great speakers. We've got a lot of good talent here in Albuquerque, but we've brought in some people from out of state also, and, and we're, we're happy to have them come and speak also. So if you decide you're going to leave for any period of time other than just to go to the restroom, you can use this door to exit, but you can only come in that door on the end. If, you're, if you want to come back in, go out that door on the end if you're going, coming in the presentation. If you're just going to the restroom and back, no problem, go out, come back. They should remember you for that long. But if you're going to be gone for any period of time over 10 minutes, make sure you get your hands stamped or they won't let you back in. Unless, we, I mean, it'd be complicated. We'll have to go through all the roster and make sure you're on there. And so get your hands stamped if you're going to leave for any period of time. We do have uh, uh, lunches, as you know, for registered in advance. We have water and coffee and cookies for everyone who's here. Cookies we'll be putting out after a break later on. And the cookies have been sponsored by our insurance companies. So uh, Evolution is not here. They don't have any personnel here, but they did send us a banner. We have uh, RPS IMC in the back, and they will be available during the breaks if anyone has questions. And then our newest insurer is Aviation Insurance Resources, or AIR. How, how cute is that? Um, and they are also in the back if you have questions during the breaks. And they have sponsored our cookies, so we appreciate them. I especially do if anyone, uh, I already did it, Don. Pointing, he's telling me what to do when he's not listening to me. So annoying. <laughs> anyway, um, the restrooms, as you know, since you've been in this building, are, are just out the door. And like I said, you can go out either, either door, but you can only get through the one on the end. Uh, the, we, if we have an emergency, we do have other doors. You just can't come back in through them. So they're only for, only for um, emergencies. In the back corner between the two insurance agencies, we have back there selling books. So if you need books that you haven't been able to find uh, for studying, if you have students or if you're a student or if you're working on your commercial, we have books in the back. And... and um, once we're done, we're, we've got boxes at both of these entrances. You've got bright colored, I believe they're orange, evaluations in the back. Please, evaluations. We are our seminars on the feedback that we get from all of you. So please fill out the evaluations and turn them in before you leave. You will get insurance credit. However, we are not going to give you certificates. There's just too many people. So if for some reason you need a certificate, if you're from Canada or somewhere, occasionally we have someone from Canada that says they need a physical certificate because they don't get their insurance from one of these guys, then, then great, we'll, we'll make one up and send it to you. We, we need to have you fill out some information if you need that. So make sure that you get with one of us, the committee members along the back, if you do need a certificate. Otherwise, we will send that information to the insurance company so you don't have to do that. Um, with that, since we're running a little bit late, we're going to ju just jump right into our first speaker. So our first speaker does not live here, but you're probably all familiar with him since he's been speaking every day at the, at the safety briefings in the morning. Brad T. Meyer has been around balloons for over 30 years. And when he was going to balloon events, he just got very intrigued by uh, what people were talking about with the weather. You know, we're a little bit more 
uh, concerned with micrometeorology in ballooning than the average than the average citizen or even anyone else that flies for that matter. So he was fascinated enough that he attended Iowa State University. He has both uh, bachelor's and master's degree in atmospheric science. And finally, after being a crew member for 25 years, he earned both his private and commercial certificates, the first one in 2008 and his commercial in 2011. So for a couple of decades now, uh, Brad has been providing weather to to lots of events, including, as you know, Fiesta. And, and uh, he will be our first speaker, Brad. Thank you very much. I've been up since 3 a.m., so we'll see uh, how well I can hold up this, this afternoon. OK, um, I'm also a FAST team member uh, for the FAA f safety team. And uh, what's great about being a part of the FAST team uh, is that you get to attend uh, various seminars and that sort of thing. And I attended one earlier this summer, uh, and it was talking about how to get the most out of a weather briefing. Um, and, and when you call for a weather briefing, you already have a general idea that it's going to be pretty good, right? Because otherwise, you, why would you be calling in the first place? You wouldn't be investing your time and your resources into lining up a flight if, if, if there wasn't some inkling that it was going to be flyable. So what this, this, this seminar that I went to emphasized, and I thought it was a great point, and it lends itself really well in this, in this presentation, is when you call, try to figure out what are your potential hazards for the flight. You've already known it's pretty good, right? But what are going to be your potential issues? Is it going to be low clouds? Is it going to be fog? Is it going to be faster winds? That sort of thing. And you can kind of determine what your main concerns are going to be. So is it going to be a visibility thing? Is it going to be a wind thing? Or is it going to be a stability thing? And we'll get more into that in this topic. By the way, I've done a lot of safety seminars all the way all around the country. Um, and so I try to keep these things fairly informal. If you have a question along the way, raise your hand, and uh, we'll certainly answer that question before we go on. And so uh, I want you guys to get something out of this besides uh, a nap for the hour. OK. So we, then you can do an analysis. So if you're dealing with a light and a variable situation, uh, what you can look for is that then you're thinking, OK, there might be some microscale winds, much like what we saw this morning, possibly, right? Or, uh, and so then in, when you're dealing with that situation, you might have to have multiple plans of, of, of landing sites. So I always hate flying in light and variable because literally you come up, you're on plan Z before you end up back on the ground again. But uh, you also have the power line attraction uh, when you're near a power line and, and your balloon runs parallel to the power line as opposed to cross uh, tangential or across the power line, right? So you, you might be dealing with that and you might have to increase your, your space between power lines. And, and, and the surface so that you, you don't have that power line attraction. Fog may be an issue, especially if you're flying in the morning. Uh, you may need to make sure your equipment is there, need a drop line possibly, might be dealing with thermals. Uh, thermals actually are, are probably most susceptible in a light wind situation, and we'll talk a little bit more about that in a little bit. Uh, but what, what I, uh, yeah, let's, so on a warm summer day, let's, when we typically like to fly the most, uh, you may be dealing with thermals or differential heating, you know, whether there's areas that are, that are shaded or like areas that are uh, blacktop or, or freshly plowed farm fields that may absorb more of the sun's energy than a, than a, a cornfield or, or a, just a regular field. Uh, stability storms, storms itself, outflow. So you can come up with a list of potential hazards and risks that you might be facing on, on a periodic situations. Similarly, in, in a stronger wind environment, you might be dealing with false lift, rotors. Uh, are you going to have fields that are big enough downwind from where you're taking off that are going to be eligible for a good landing spot? And, and you, what, what type of things that you might have to uh, prepare for if you have a fast or hard landing? So when you call for your weather brief itself, they'll read you the TAF. And the TAF is a great tool to start off with. But the problem with the TAF is that it has some limitations. And it's good to know that these limitations. So basically, TAFs are issued for a five-mile radius around the airport. And when I get on the tower every morning, I, I, I tell you both uh, Sunport and, and Double Eagle. Uh, but the problem with, with uh, with that is, is they're both actually outside of the five mile radius. So they're not necessarily, they're, they may have some elements that are representative of the weather around the region, but they're not specifically written for Balloon Fiesta Park. So are they representative of what's going on here? 
maybe in a ballpark fashion, but not precisely. And what I mean by that is this, is that when we are writing a TAF, uh, you cannot put uh, like showers or thunderstorms in the forecast unless you think it's going to affect that five mile radius bubble. So in other words, uh, like we, this morning we had vicinity showers in the TAF for, the, for Albuquerque Sunport, but we did not have sh vicinity showers in the TAF for, uh, for Double Eagle. And the difference was is that they, we, they still had some straggling showers down near the Sunport airport, but up further to the north, those had all dissipated and moved to the east. So that's, that's what, you, what I want to point out here is that the TAF can give you a general ballpark idea, but it may not be the sole information provider of your potential hazards. So you're going to have to dig a little bit deeper than just getting the TAF information to try to figure out what's going on. Uh, similarly, like I said, it, it, it contains information about surface winds, visibility, weather, like I talked about with the uh, showers, obstructions to visibility, so if you're having fog, thunderstorms, whatever it may be, that would, would, uh, would reduce that visibility. Sky cover, so that's, that's going to be more of a regional thing unless you have some sort of localized effect that's leading to, to a potential change in sky cover. And then non-convective low-level wind shear, uh, which, by the way, we, we uh, generally write low-level wind shear for uh, a change in, vert in uh, velocity of 35 knots or greater. So if you're seeing low-level wind shear, it probably is not a good sign that you should be flying. All right, uh, TAFs are mainly composed of three different groups. You have a from group, which is a prevailing group. Uh, that's basically gonna indicate what's going on in the atmosphere. Uh, and, and it basically starts at the, at the top of the hour or whatever the, the from starts at. Um, and, and then it will run until the next from group. Uh, the tempo group is basically written for m a maximum, I believe, of four hours, if I remember correctly, and it basically highlights fluctuations in, in the weather that's expected. But when it does, w what it does is it's, it's basically, it's, we're supposed to be a very narrow situation. So if you're expecting just temporarily lower ceilings, or maybe just a brief rain shower, something like that, that would be the case of using a tempo. Uh, otherwise, in general, the, the Weather Service does not like to encourage the use of tempos and really are, are trying to push as little use of them as possible. Uh, and they want to keep these tasks as, as con short, as concise as possible, so it's not gonna have all the details that, that, that you need uh, to really have a good understanding of what's expected in, 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 in a flight. Uh, also, the PROB 30 group, that's basically more of an outlook type thing. So beyond nine hours in the TAFs and when the TAF is issued, uh, we'll have a PROB 30 group for mainly uh, showers and thunderstorms or, or precipitation type stuff. We'll talk, sometimes we also do it for reduced, uh, reduced visibility, but it's not, um, not used as often for that. But basically the point is, is that it, 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 it's a highlight for the potential of, of some sort of reduced uh, minimums that, that, that you might need uh, in your flight window. Okay, so they also give you your winds aloft, and a lot of times when I'm calling uh, flight service, they'll say, you know, what, what altitudes do you want your winds at, that sort of thing. This is where it actually comes from. So it comes from a, a chart, and you can see here down, down the left-hand side, it's got all your airports, and then it's got columns, and it's got a 3,000 foot, 6,000, 9,000, 12,000, 18,000, et cetera, et cetera. What you also see at the top of it is it's, it's for use from 5Z to 9Z. And we all know that weather does not change in a four hour time frame, right? <laughs> so the point is, is that those winds that they're giving you at three, six, and nine, uh, or maybe going to 12 sometimes, those are average wind speeds over time and, and space. So given that that's the case, again, you're dealing with ballpark information. So the TAF that they give you is ballpark, the winds aloft that they give you are ballpark, so you've gotten a ballpark estimate of what your flight, wind, flight conditions are expected to be. And for balloonists, which we're probably one of the more susceptible forms of aviation to weather in, 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 the, in, this, in aviation in general, it's a big deal. So, <laughs> I uh, developed this family tree uh, working, just going around the country and kind of figuring out there's, there's various things uh, that can impact your flight. So you come up with your plans for your flight and the, sometimes there are things that just don't go, to go according to plan, kind of like this morning. So you can, uh, 
basically, if you're, th if you're thinking that wind is going to be one of your major issues, uh, you can still come up with a game plan on how things are going to roll, but then there are things that will just impact you that you weren't even planning on in the first place. So we're going to spend much of the hour talking about these, uh, these, and these wind modifiers, and I call them the Fagotcha family because you forgot them and they got you. So they basically will modify your con expected conditions, and they can end your flight prematurely if you don't potentially account for these. So it's just kind of good to keep them in the back of your mind when you're coming up with a plan for your flight to try to figure out exactly is, if that is going to be a potential risk for you or not when you're doing your flight. So uh, we'll start with false lift. False lift generally occurs when the balloon is on the ground and the air is moving over the top of the balloon faster than your balloon is moving. And so it, until your balloon is moving at the same speed as the wind where the balloon is located, you are going to have false lift. So this can occur when you're just taking off and you're just accelerating to the wind condition itself or when you're moving into a faster wind current, say a low-level jet say it, it, somewhere in the central plains or upper Midwest, somewhere in that, in, that, in that realm. Okay, so flying in wind, basically the key is, is that wind flows, wind flows around objects and can cause turbulence. Um, it's common to find wind that interacts with articles on the surface, uh, and, and these shears are, can, can be somewhat violent. Like, let's say you're going over... Um, uh, a large hill or, or a bluff, you can get rotors that occur just on the downwind side. If you don't give that space uh, with that hill great, a, a great enough amount of respect, you can get uh, pushed down toward the ground if you're, if you're not accounting for that. Um, and so basically the strengths of these shears can, can depend basically on the dimensions of the object that the wind is trying to go around. So if it's going around a building versus going through a tree or a baby tree, there's a big difference there. Similarly, uh, the permeability, how much it can flow through that object, and the speed of the air at which it's moving. So if it's moving faster, obviously it's going to be more of a radical change. Winds generally can, the wind shadow can persist five to ten times downwind of the obstacles of height, and we saw that a classic example of that on Saturday morning, if I remember right. They all kind of bleed together to me. Uh, when the rock shielded us, us from the wind where uh, Sunport was gusting to 30 miles per hour while everybody was flying, because they were not shielded. So I just want to talk a little bit about surface observations, and then we'll kind of get in more into the meteorology side of stuff. Um, so this is what a typical surface observation is. Uh, this number up here, the, the number in yellow, that is what a, the temperature is, um, and this is reported in Fahrenheit. The number on the lower left is the dew point, that's if, or the 58 here in this case, that's the dew point. And the number up here in the upper right-hand corner is your surface pressure. That number is, is a little bit tricky because when these things were designed way back in the day, uh, sending out data was costly, so they tried to limit the no amount of data that they were tr sending out as much as possible. So the way it works, the way it's read, is it, if it's a low number, you add a 10 in front of it, and if it's a high number, you add a 9 in front of it. So in general, uh, so because surface pressures, like, you, like you've heard me reading, this is the surface pressure in millibars, and surface pressures generally are around 1,000 millibars. So, so given that that's the case, uh, in this case, this would be 1,000... 1,002.7 millibars is the way that's read. So you do, would add a 10 in front of it because it's a relatively low number. If it was a 996 or a 998, it's a relatively high number, and so we'd add a 9 in front of it. All right, and the, the uh, let's see here. The sky cover is indicated in the, in the circle here So by the amount of shading. So if only one quarter of it is shaded, that means it's a few is reported if half of it is shaded, that is a scattered deck, three quarters is broken, and if the entire circle is shaded, it's completely overcast. And then the wind is indicated by where the wind is coming from. So think of it as an arrow. Here's your feathers on your arrow, and here's the t uh, head of the arrow here buried in this circle. So in this case, the wind is coming from the southeast, and the speed of it is indicated by these barbs. A full barb is 10 knots, and a half a barb is 5 knots. You add them together, so in this case, we have a wind out of the southeast at 15 knots. Are you guys with me so far? Good. All right. 
So then when we combine all these surface observations together, we can actually start to see circulations that develop in the atmosphere. And, and in the northern hemisphere, or let's, yeah, northern hemisphere of the globe, uh, winds generally flow clockwise around high pressure systems and they actually flow a little bit out of the center of the high. So you actually get, and these are generally favorable for balloonists and because uh, they lead to lighter winds. As they're flowing out, the, the pressure gradient or the gradient of uh, the lines of equal pressure around the center of the high uh, spread out. So it's, it's actually a fairly favorable weather condition for ballooning. Contrary to that is the low pressure system. You can see that that low pressure system, the flow is, is counterclockwise around the low, and it will actually flow in toward the center of the low slightly. You get, you get a flow that actually uh, flows into this, this center point. When it gets there, obviously it can't flow into the ground, so it, it flows upward in the atmosphere. So that's why a lot of time there's upward motion associated with low pressure systems and you can get showers and thunderstorms, and that's kind of one of the ways that we can get lift in the atmosphere. But uh, th that's, that, that's basically the general circulation, but we've got a lot of things that will modify that, but that's the basic concept that we can start with and we'll build on this throughout the talk. So like I said, you can get these general circulations in the atmosphere. Here's one uh, back home, obviously in the wintertime, because they're dealing with sub-freezing temperatures. But in this case, you can see that counterclockwise circulation somewhere centered around Sioux Falls. Um, so that's the, that's the case where we're dealing with a low pressure system, fairly inclement weather, and, and not ideal for ballooning. So you can kind of put these together. Here's another example of a fairly strong low pressure system, probably centered somewhere down in southern Iowa. You can see that counterclockwise circulation. Again, you just flow from the tail to the point, and you can kind of get these general circulations in the atmosphere. But that's how we start. Then from there, things start to modify. So then you get these small scale circulations that develop in the atmosphere, kind of like what we had this morning. Uh, another way that that can happen is sea lake breezes, um, uh, coastal breezes, that sort of thing. And so these are kind of nice, but basically uh, nice to understand, but basically how it works is think of it as the, during the daytime hours, the, the sun will come down and heat both the water and the land, but the land heats up faster than the water. And since it does so, you, you're much warmer over the land than you are over the wa water, and, so, and the atmosphere likes to maintain balance. So you've got this lift because the atmosphere is warmer over here, so you've got the lift going up over here, and, and then something has to replace that. And the atmosphere, like I said, likes to maintain balance. So it's gonna draw air from the colder locations in toward the warmer locations to replace that air that's being lifted. And then you develop the, the top side of that circulation uh, just in it's just a cycle basically that goes around. Similarly, or contrarily, depending on how you look at it, uh, the, the winds will flow the exact opposite way at night because the land cools off faster than the water does. The emissivity of water is, is greater than the emissivity of land. And so you get this flow that originates from the land, goes out to the water, and the water's warmer, so it creates lift, and then you get this circulation that develops. But this can, like I said, this is the simplified version because you can ha get it with lake sea breezes and that sort of thing, but you can also get it in all sorts of different ways. Uh, you can get it with just a change in land cover. So in this case here, you can see that, that we've got a, a dirt field versus a, a green field. So the dirt field is gonna be heated stronger. So given that that's the case, that's where your lift is gonna be. So the air is gonna start to flow from the grass field here toward the, toward the, uh, toward the browner field where it's been heated because the atmosphere is trying to maintain balance. And this is all going to be a, a, a generalized, localized effect that's going to affect you in your flight. Slope and, slope and valley mountain winds. So uh, those that fly around the, uh, the higher terrain areas, obviously we don't have those back in Sioux Falls, but basically the, what happens is, is at night, much like we see here, here uh, if we actually get the box this week, hopefully, uh, you get the drainage that flows down, down the mountain uh, through, throughout the night, and then during the day it reverses, so it actually flows back up the hill as you get the heating. Uh, I mentioned this a little bit ago, rotors, uh, they can basically affect, or occur on the downwind side of a mountain, um, and if you do not give these enough space, uh, they, will, they will be problematic for you, especially if the flow is stronger. So this is an example of me 
uh, this, uh, coming across this ridge line, I was flying from right to left in this photo. Um, and in this case, uh, there was a small rotor effect as I came across this ridge line, uh, bringing me down much closer to the surface probably than I had originally anticipated. Uh, basically because you get that flow uh, that curls down just past the ridge line itself. So the best way to handle these types of situations is to give it plenty of space. You notice the rotors aren't as, as, as uh, drastic as, as, you get, as you get higher into the atmosphere. So if you give these enough space, uh, you may be able to fly through this area and not notice anything at all. Downdrafts. Okay, we dealt with this a uh, few years ago. I did the weather for the women's championship in 2016 down here, and uh, we had a shortened week compared to Fiesta. So I happened to have the opportunity to shadow the weather team down here at Balloon Fiesta Park before I flew out on that Thursday morning in 2016. Um, and we happened to have an outflow that occurred uh, that came through in the middle of the flight window. Pretty fascinating thing given that it originated from a thunderstorm the day before in Colorado. So what happens was, is basically anytime you get a downdraft from a shower or a thunderstorm, you have the potential for outflow. And I'll say this, down here, it's, it's, it's an outflow rich region. And the reason, reason why is because outflow really, really likes dry air. So the, what happens is, is the rain starts to fall from the thunder or uh, base of the cloud itself. And when it falls, it's, it's, the, it's falling into air that is not saturated, right? Because it's below the cloud base, it's, you're not dealing with the cloud anymore. Um, and here it's a relatively dry region. So when it's falling into a non-saturated air mass, it starts to evaporate. And evaporation is a cooling process. Much like when you go to the gym and you work out, your body sweats, and the reason it's doing that is because it's trying to cool you down. Uh, similarly, it, since that's an, a, a cooling process, it accelerates the air toward the ground, it reaches the ground, and then it, it has nowhere else to go. So it will initially spread out equally in all directions. Then it becomes modified by that, 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 that flow that we were talking about, whether it's around a high pressure system or a low pressure system. It becomes modified by that flow, and it will continue to flow in the direction uh, that the synoptic scale wind is. So what I mean by that is this is that if your flow is out of the northwest then you, and then you set up a drainage overnight, like we did two years ago, you have the potential for outflow coming from the north. And that was exactly what happened when we, on that Thursday morning in 2016 when we had uh, the outflow that came through during the flight window. Fortunately, we didn't have a series of outflows because uh, there was just one thunderstorm that produced an outflow, but if we had had a series of outflows, it might have it might have been more of a significant issue. Outflow, the way it it hits is it hits with a ton of vengeance. Uh, it just hits like a ton of bricks, and then it will modify with time back to the original state of the environment. So it hits you, and you're just like, "Holy cow! Where did that come from? How long is this going to last?" Type stuff. And then within a half an hour, as long as it's, it's just one single outflow, it will actually work its way back to what you had before. You, so, and, and these things are relatively shallow. Typically, uh, in the lowest 2,000 feet, sometimes even shallower. Um, and so, g given that that's the case, um, it's, it's, uh, the best way to handle outflow is if it's a single outflow. Uh, is to go up and let this thing roll below you and then you can come back down in 20 minutes to a half an hour and the, and the environment will have modified back to its original state. However, if it's multiple series of outflows, then you're dealing with a whole other scenario and there's no easy way to really see these things, unfortunately. Um, we're trying to get a good handle on this for Fiesta because I do think that it's a, it's a problem, uh, that, that a potential issue that we could see in the future. Um, and they're not easy to see on radar because they are confined to the lowest uh, 2,000 feet in the environment. The good news is that locally here in Albuquerque, we do have a radar that's very close. And so you do get data in the lowest 2,000 feet. So our plan is, is to basically, if we see that there's the potential for thunderstorms in the region, uh, just like we've seen here over the last few days, uh, we would literally watch the radar very, very closely and if we, see the, if we see some sort of fine line or boundary working its way towards where we're flying, uh, we'd try to land before that boundary worked its way in. These outflows are, are, like I said, very problematic for us, and they can travel 50 plus miles very easily. 
Uh, we had an outflow that came through during our balloon event in Sioux Falls back in the late 90s, and it pushed over 400 miles away from a parent thunderstorm before it stopped. It basically will go until it finds something that stops it, like a mountain range or something that's that geographic, uh, or it runs out of steam. But basically, these, these types of things can travel quite, quite significant distances. Thermals. <laughs> They've been a big problem for us the last few years, too. So we had the... I'm sure many of you have seen the video from Chatsworth, Illinois, um, where a balloon took off in thermals and, uh, and, and it, it became problematic. Basically, here's what I want to say about thermals. The way thermals work is we have them every day, no matter, no matter if you want them or not. It works just like a pot of, of boiling water on the stove. So basically, anytime the sun is up in the atmosphere, you're heating that pot of water on the stove. And so you start to get these bubbles that form at the bottom of the pot, and they rise throughout the day, and they get stronger and stronger throughout the day as you increase the heating from the sun. Then eventually the sun's angle becomes low enough in the atmosphere that, that, uh, that, the, no, that the heating is no longer effective. And get, when, that, when that happens, then the, the bubbles start to decrease. Um, but, but really how deep and how long those last can depend on all sorts of things. So how easy that heat is able to transfer upward in the atmosphere, the length of day. So in the middle of the summer, these thermals are going to be much stronger than they are in the middle of the winter. And you can see that around here in Albuquerque, you know, in the summertime, balloonists aren't going to be flying in the summertime in the evening hours, but they can do that, do it so safely in the winter. Stratification of the atmosphere, do we have any inversions? That's one of the things I, I really like to look for uh, when I'm going flying, just to kind of try to get a good understanding of how the atmosphere is going to behave. And then uh, how much moisture is in the atmosphere? It's a little bit harder to heat moist atmospheres versus dry atmospheres. Eventually, like I said, the sun angle is going to become low enough in the atmosphere that it's not going to be able to heat the, the surface effectively, and the ener transfer of energy from the surface becomes cut off, and, and then you start to develop an inversion. So the ideal set of, of for, for ideal for thermals is this, is that basically you're dealing with a strong sun angle, so sometime in the middle of the summer, uh, light winds and a dry atmosphere, which... It sounds like I'm talking about Albuquerque weather, really. Um, so basically, if you're looking for an evening flight, the key is, is to make sure that your temperature, when you're getting ready to fly, has fallen from the daytime high. So in the case of the Chatsworth, Illinois uh, thermal, um, they had one degree of separation from the daytime high. So they were basically, you know, we all talk about the six degrees of Kevin Bacon. They were one degree away from flying in the middle of the afternoon. So it's, it's, it's just like basically flying one degree away from three o'clock in the afternoon. And when you put it in those terms, flying, we all wouldn't even consider flying at three o'clock in the afternoon. So you wanna, you wanna just, and you can get your, your forecasted uh, temperature information on when that temperature is gonna start to come down. I just grabbed this off of the Weather Service hourly prog charts that you can get. They're all free and you can click, get them for anywhere in the country. Shameless plug, I suppose, since I worked for the Weather Service. But uh, you can get this information in all sorts of places and varieties. Um, you can get it from model data too that will kind of give you some information on on where where the uh, the where the, where, the, where the temperature is expected to be uh, in any given time at, or in space, for that matter. So I'd, I'd encourage you to use this and then make sure that, that the forecast is actually verifying. So uh, you can find out the information for the, the daily high uh, around the area and make sure that your temperature has at least a couple degrees. That's what I always like to see, at least a couple degrees, because then you know that that trend is in place. It just hasn't temporarily dipped. Uh, because a cloud moved overhead over the sensor or something like that. That's just basically uh, giving you a temporary reprieve from the high temperature. Okay, jumping back to wind shear a little bit. Wind shear basically is just a change in direction of uh, or speed in the atmosphere. Uh, basically, you can get a wind, spear, wind, wind shear uh, when you enter a faster layer of wind and, and, and suddenly caves in the side of the balloon. Um, and, and so... If, if you, like, let's say, for example, if you're flying into a low-level jet in the Midwest, uh, you can encounter low-level wind shear pretty easily. Um, and, it, and you just got to watch how, how uh, your balloon is going to be behaving 
uh, as you're flying in and out of these various la wind layers. The best way to do it is to enter it at a moderate pace and don't, don't, don't go into it with where your balloon is too soft. Um, and similarly, don't punch right through it either. Um, that's not necessarily the best thing because then you're just accelerating two forces against each other. Okay, so we talked about low-level jets. They have a, I won't spend too much time on it because they're not as pertinent down here, but I do want to briefly touch on them. Uh, they do have a huge influence on, on actually precipitation development in the central portion of the U.S. So I just want to briefly touch on them. Um, in years when, uh, when, we don't see, when we see severe drought, a lot of times we don't get the low-level jet to form or it, if it does form, it's capped. So there's some sort of inversion in the atmosphere that prevents thunderstorms from developing in the first place. But they do occur basically in, our, in, in the summer months, that, the months that we typically fly the most. Um, and so they're really important uh, to try to get a good handle and understanding on them. The direction is usually from the south or southwest, and they can have a maximum of 30 to 50 knots, sometimes stronger than that. Um, so they're important, and they're, they f form just above the, uh, just above the surface. Uh, is, so they're, they're really in, in our flying space. And, and that, that layer just above the surface is really in a data void area for us. So it's really kind of a problematic area to try to figure out what's, how to wrap your head around these things. When you're calling for a weather briefing, oftentimes, like I said, they'll give you winds at three and 6,000 feet. Low-level jets are typically lower than that. So, uh, so given that that's the case, calling and getting the winds there and then getting your TAF information, which is forecasted surface information, that may not tip you off that there's a low-level jet. Low-level jets can happen for a lot of variety of reasons. And there's the scientific explanations, but if I went through that, it would put you all to sleep. <laughs> so I'll just go on. Uh, but generally, like I said, they occur very low in the atmosphere, generally three to 3,000 feet. Um, and occur uh, basically where there's not a lot of data available. So you can use the VAD wind profiler off of the National Weather Service radars. That's a good source or model data to try to figure out uh, what's going on. I know that a lot of people like to use Ryan Carlton's site. That's a great way to kind of interrogate the data just to, and get finer detailed resolution uh, to try to understand whether you're going to be dealing with a potential for a low-level jet. So here's what a VAD wind profiler looks like if you haven't seen one before. And I know that uh, when you call the uh, call for flight service, and they a lot of times will say, hey, do you want me to take a look at the VAD? And they can certainly do that for you. Um, so here's what a VAD looks like. Basically what it is is it's the radar sending out information working very similar to the profiler that we have here on the northwest corner. By the way, that is really, really cool. <laughs> it's really awesome. I'm going to nerd out a little bit. It's really awesome to have that data available. Uh, this is the only, I go around the country and around the world doing balloon events, and this is the only balloon event to ha that I have the opportunity to play with a profiler. It's really one of our greatest assets that we have uh, here, and I would encourage anybody that flies locally to use the profiler at Double Eagle on a regular basis when you're planning your flight. It's a really great tool and it gives you a lot of information about what's going on in the atmosphere. Um, so basically here's what's going on. These, these work very similarly to a profiler as it's taking that, it's taking a mathematical algorithm and it's sensing vibration off of particles in the atmosphere and it's, it's trying to match up the two. And when it can do a fairly good job, it matches them up in, in these cool colors down here, blues and, and, the, and the cyans and, and maybe even the greens. But once it can't do that as good of a job, it will start to produce them in the yellows and reds. Yellows and reds are, are less reliable data. And, and if it doesn't match it up well enough, it will just spit out an ND. So that means no data is available. So a lot of times when the skies are clear and the winds are relatively light, uh, you will get no data because the, uh, the uh, radar can't make sense as to what's going on at a particular layer. Likewise, the VAD wind profiler, like I said, is a good source of data. A wind profiler is even better. And the difference is, is significant because the VAD wind will give you a, a vertical resolution of 1,000 feet. So in a, for example, it's going to give you the lowest, uh, the lowest case here at 2,000 and then going up to 3,000, 4,000, et cetera. Um, in, in, in the, the, the wind profiler gives you a lot more resolution, so you're getting data, you're getting several trips every couple hundred feet. So it's, it's really a much more fine-scale resolution data. If you want the, um, 
the, uh, to get the VADWIN profiler and look at it for yourself. The best place I've been able to find it is the, the College of DuPage site. I included an example at the bottom. That's what it looks like. And then you would just use your three-letter uh, weather service office on the last three letters there, basically to uh, get the, the, the radar for, for your location near you. Okay, so uh, like I said, you can use uh, models to try to gauge good wind information, and we have lots of models in, uh, in, in the weather or in, in meteorology. Um, but model output statistics is, is one of the ways that you can use this information. Uh, basically what it does is it uses linear regression uh, to forecast various predictors in the atmosphere. So for example, it's going to predict temperature, and it's going to predict dew point, and it's going to predict wind speed, and it's going to predict wind direction. And those are all independent of, of one another. So you can get, like I said, you can get lots of different model output statistics. You can get it where it updates every hour or twice per day. And the more frequently it updates, the less in distance, it's, or less in time it's going to go out. So if it's updating every hour, it's only going to go out maybe 12 to 18 hours, something like that, or maybe 24, but not any longer than that because it's just computationally too expensive to run stuff like that. But the further you want it to go out, so if you're looking out for and planning a flight, let's say five to seven days out, something like that, you want to go to these extended models, and those only update twice per day. So you've got a variety of tools at your at your fingertips if you want to use them, and it's all free data because you've paid for it already through your tax dollars. So this is an example of what model output statistics is. I'm not going to spend too much time on this by any means, but like I said, t it has temperature, dew point, cloud cover. So this is clear, scattered, overcast, broken, scattered, broken. Um, and then it's for the various time frames, and it's all in Zulu time because the way we work in meteorology is we all work off of one meteorological clock, so that way, just to keep things simple and to keep time codes to where you're, say you're on a boundary between, um, uh, like say, uh, central time and mountain time, you don't have to deal with that with sticking with one standard clock around the world. So that's why everything's done in Zulu time. Uh, wind direction, wind speed, the chance of precipitation or the pop in a six-hour time frame, chance of precipitation in a 12-hour time frame, uh, the um, amount of precipitation expected, the chance of thunderstorms, precipitation type, et cetera, et cetera. Um, some, maybe some, a couple important down here at the bottom. Cloud ceiling, so this is a category for cloud ceiling on how high or low the cloud ceiling will be. Higher numbers indicate higher cloud ceilings. Lower numbers indicate lower cloud ceilings. Um, visibility and then the obstruction of visibility, whether it would be fog, rain, snow, that sort of thing. And we all know that visibility is relatively important. And just to keep in mind that we have to be 500 feet below, 1,000 feet above, and 2,000 feet horizontal from any cloud source. I think, I haven't had a chance to see the handouts yet, but did you guys all get handouts for Go 16? Yes, I hear good, that's awesome. Go 16 is a brand new tool, and I, I kind of debuted it, uh, let's see here. We just got it in the last year in the weather service. And what's amazing about this is the resolution of the data that we're really getting. Um, it's, it's, it's really incredible. Uh, we, can send, we can put these into high resolution suites um, during severe weather. Obviously, during severe weather, you'd probably not be ballooning. But we, get, we can get data as frequently as every one minute from the satellite. And it looks, the detail is just incredible. Um, you, like I said, when you're dealing on a global scale, you can't see as much detail. But here's a river valley over in uh, uh, far eastern Minnesota into uh, far western Wisconsin and northern Iowa. And you can see the fog banks developing in the river valleys itself. It, the resolution is really incredible. Here's another example I just wanted to take uh, from the upper Midwest. You can differentiate, uh, which, what's really cool about this is you can differentiate between valley fog here, like I showed on the previous image, and areas of smoke and areas of clouds. We can literally pick up different cloud levels and heights with this new data. It's really, really cool, um, and it's, 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 it's really impressive. Um, and I, <laughs> another shameless plug. Uh, it, it, you, the best place to probably view this data is on the College of DuPage site again. Um, 
and you could j I would just encourage you to play around with it. I've got this huge handout on the various different channels. So the Go 16 has 16 channels where you can kind of filter. It, a channel basically just filters different data, satellite data, so it, it tries to point out different facets to you and what's going on in the atmosphere. So you can put uh, a filter on that would kind of hint fog potential for you, or you can kind of put a filter on that would focus on the higher levels of the atmosphere if you were interested in that. So, and, and all that information is, is in that handout. It's, it's really good stuff, though. Another tool that you could use to, probably, to possibly figure out what your potential risks are. So I kind of hinted at fog there, so we'll go into fog just a little bit. There are three main types of fog, advection fog, radiation fog, and steam fog. And, and radiation fog is probably the most common. Advection fog, fog is probably the, the worst of the three. You can get fog to form in several different other ways, but those are, we'll just focus on, on, on fog in general. Fog is kind of a, a beast for us because the conditions can change very radically. Here's an, uh, a great example out of Ohio. You can see a balloon is getting ready for flight, uh, and at 7.33, nothing's, it, it doesn't look too bad, we're, we're, so we're going to go ahead and inflate, and just, less th just over a half an hour later, we're completely shrouded in fog. It just completely moved in and set in fairly quickly. So the question is, is how to know when fog is going to be an issue before the flight? So UPS, they, you pay them a lot of money to ship your packages all around the country and around the world, and fog is a huge detriment to what their mission and their goal is. So they spent a lot of money and a lot of times trying to study fog and wrap their head around it. And this is what they came up with. After they, came up, after they studied it, they, they came up with this thing called the crossover temperature. And basically you take your dew point from the previous day when you reach your high temperature. So it's sometimes typically in the late afternoon hours, Take your dew point, and then you take your low temperature for the following night. And if your dew point during that high temperature is higher than your low temperature, you have the potential for fog. So let's say, for example, let's say, for example, you have uh, a temperature. You're forecasting a low of freezing, and and when you reach your high temperature that day, your dew point was 37 degrees. So given that that's the case, we're, we're forecasting a low of 32. We have a dew point at 37 when we reached our high temperature. Given that our, our low temperature is going to get lower than the dew point from the prior day when we reached our maximum temperature, there's the possibility of radiational fog. That's, that's as simple as it gets. Another way, another tool, if you don't like that tool, uh, is, is to look at the latest uh, short-term high-resolution models. So I kind of hinted at this in the model output statistics stuff, but you can look at the, what's called the high-resolution rapid refresh. It's a mouthful. That's where the HRRR comes from, or the rapid atmosphere. Uh, I don't even remember what the RAP stands for. But uh, it, they basically go out 18 hours in, in, in time, and they will give you the latest information. Uh, when there's, so you can, you, you get all sorts of information. You can get forecasted reflectivity at the one kilometer. You can get composite reflectivity. You can get a uh, measure of cape and sin in the atmosphere, which is stability. Um, and then you can get all sorts of things. And if you scroll down to the bottom, there's even one for visibility, which is really good. And that's what it looks like. So you can see that it's, it, it tries to really accurately spit out what the visibility is going to be in these various places. Just in, from an operational standpoint, I will say it has a uh, a little bit of a bias in terms of whether it's going to uh, produce it or not. So, it, like, there's very little uh, in between. It's either going to be there or it's not. So you don't see a lot of this. You mostly see, yeah, we're going to have fog here, and we're not going to, or we're going to have fog here in the gray areas, and we're not going to have fog right here. Um, but if you look at this over time and space, you can actually see, uh, say, like, let's say if you look at two runs in a row and, 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 and uh, it's not producing fog, you can start to develop some, some sense of confidence that there's not going to be fog or fog is not going to be an issue for you. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about, in the atmosphere, what it takes to make a cloud. I know, this, um, but basically, it, if you think about it in, in ingredients form, like, like if you're going to make a cake, uh, basically, you need two things. We need saturation and lift. So let's just say our dry ingredients are saturation, 
uh, when we're making a cake, and our wet ingredients, like the milk and eggs, are the lift. Okay, so given that that's the case, um, somebody was asking me, uh, I, when I go and speak at safety seminars around the country and around the world, what's the difference between good fog and bad fog? And I'm like, good fog and bad fog, I don't, I, I don't like fog to begin with, but because uh, it's a bear to forecast. But she's like, yeah, good fog, you know, goes away with time, and bad fog gets worse with time. So I was like, well, I don't know. Let me think about that for a little bit. And I know some people have asked me about this morning, and this is kind of how this all works, is that I just kind of think about it for a while. Sometimes I get my most harebrained ideas when I'm running, so maybe I need to go run for a little bit and thinking about this morning, and I'll come up with a reason on why, why people had some thermal-type activity. Um, but the, 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 the answer is this. And I get, I get it that I'm showing skew T's and those look pretty scary. But uh, let me just sh explain what these are depicting. So this is, this is the uh, profile of the vertical, just think of it as a vertical slice in the atmosphere of the atmospherics just right above you, okay? And, and so basically it's just taking like a slice of the atmosphere, just like you're slicing apple, you're slicing down and you're just looking at what is going on in that slice of the apple itself. So. What we have is on the, on, on, the, on the far right here is the temperature profile of that vertical slice, and what we have on the left is the, in the other, the other line here, is the dew point. And so anytime that temperature line and the dew point line are close together, you can expect the potential for clouds. So the difference between good fog and bad fog is this, is that in good fog cases, you notice that the, where those lines come together is very, very shallow and confined just to the surface layer itself. But in the cases of bad fog, that layer where the temperature and dew point are very, very close together extends for a significant depth in the atmosphere. So that's the difference between good fog and bad fog. Any questions on that so far? Yes. Is that, is that a what? Yes, these are actually these are actual real soundings that came from the good fog bad fog cases, but you can also get this data in forecast form, and that's where like if you go to Ryan Carlton's site, he's basically getting the same data here, and in the last year he updated it to include temperature and dew point data for you there, so you can you can use this this type of thing to really figure out very quickly whether you have the potential for fog and if it's going to get worse or better for you. Like I said, <laughs> kind of a, I'm, I'm, I'm getting ahead of the game there. He has now included temperature dew point information. So if you look here, uh, the top number is the temperature, uh, and the lower number is the dew point. And you can see in, in, in cases how deep that saturated layer is going to be. The deeper it's going to be, the more potential you have for bad fog. So we had a really bad accident a couple years ago on July 30th of 2016 in, uh, in Texas. And uh, if you look, here's the data from that particular day. I drew a red line on there to indicate where the, uh, where, where the basically the atmosphere was no longer saturated. So basically from the surface, this is all in MSL. Uh, so basically we're around 750 feet uh, mean sea level there on the surface and then it extends about to 3,000 feet. So we're saturated roughly for about 2,500 feet before it starts to dry out and remain no longer saturated. So think of it this way. Before the sunrise, all we had, we had that flour sitting around, we had all our dry ingredients sitting around. And then all, so that was the saturation part, right? So all we needed then was to make our cake is we needed to add the lifting mechanism. And we talked earlier in this talk about thermals, and thermals are there anytime you have the sun. So guess what? As soon as we added the sun, guess what happened? Because all it takes to make a cloud is saturation and lift. That's, we started to develop clouds. So you can see here, here's the observations from that fateful day, unfortunately. Uh, looking prior to 6 o'clock, we didn't have any issues with clouds. But once we introduce that sun at sunrise, right around uh, shortly after 6 o'clock that particular morning, we started to develop clouds, first a few at 1,300 feet. Then once those thermals just got just a little bit stronger and we enhanced that mixing just a little bit more, all of a sudden, bam, we developed an overcast ceiling at 300 feet. And then as those thermals started to grow, 
in depth in the atmosphere, then that cloud is that cloud deck is, is going to start to rise throughout the day. So we now we're up to 400 feet. But you can see that in this particular case, it would literally was a recipe for disaster because we had all the ingredients in place for bad fog. So the point is of, of this talk basically is what I want you to do is, is keep an eye out for the potential hazards in your flight. You, if, you've got, if you've picked out a point where, where really it's going to be good conditions, try to figure out what your potential hazards are and just keep them percolating in the back of your mind. And if it's something that's going to bother you, look into it a little bit more and try to figure out exactly how to determine if it is going to be an issue for you. Uh, I, will, I will throw this out there that no model is ever perfect. Uh, model forecasts are, are, uh, for potential hazards are not a guarantee. So like I said, if, it, if it's producing fog one hour and you, and you really want to go for the flight, check it the next hour and see if that, that next run is still producing the fog. If, you, if you've got some, some consistency in time, it's more likely than not that the model's picked up on something. But if there's no consistency in it, I wouldn't put a lot of faith in it and I would still search for additional information. Observations are really great because it means it's occurring. So if you're getting bad wind profiler information or if you're getting, pro, uh, uh, or if you're getting uh, wind profiler information, that is real observed data that you can get from basically a data void area. They're really awesome. And, and it's, really, it's, it's data that you can take to the bank day in and day out. It's, it's, it le literally means it's happening. Focus on the observations upstream of your location to determine what potential issues you may have. So if your wind is from the east, you should be looking at observations from the east. Now, obviously, here in Albuquerque proper, that's not necessarily the best thing because we have that big rock uh, going on just to the east of us. But in general, if the, if, even if the wind is coming from a, a direction that you wouldn't expect, because so, we're mainly in the prevailing westerlies belt, so people like to look to the west, um, if your wind is coming from the east or from a different direction, look that direction upstream and see what your potential hazards are. And finally, watch for your depth of saturation. The deeper it is, the more likely you are to have fog issues, especially once you develop those thermals throughout the day. What other questions do you guys have? Yes, up front. So the question was, is how deep does the saturation have to be before you make a determination that it's less than ideal and you should probably cancel? I don't have the magic number because a lot of it's going to depend on how uh, the sun angle, right? Because the, 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 the sun angle, the stronger it is, it can burn through that deeper layer. But with that said, I would think if you are saturated for over 500 feet in the atmosphere, the potential for you to, to burn that off relatively quickly throughout the morning is, is small. So um, I, would say, I would use that as a starting point, but I wouldn't take it to the bank. Um, you know, if you start to see that that depth is, is, is more than a couple hundred feet thick, it's like, mm, this might not be the best day. And, it, and on those days, it might be good, even if you wanted to go out and fly anyway, just to keep an eye on it. So you say, let's say you're going out and, and you might delay your flight a half an hour or 45 minutes after sunrise to really see if this stuff is going to develop on you or not. And, and, but I would bet, just because of the way the atmosphere works, like I said, all you need is three ingredients, or two ingredients, saturation and lift to create a cloud. And so if you've already got the ingredients in place, literally all you need is that mixing in place to get to, to induce that cloud, and basically the cloud is going to form right on the ground. So I would say I would give it. I would say right around 500 feet as a starting point, and then adjust from there based on your your sun angle uh, and time of year. Good question. Yes. Next question. That's another great question. Usually I cover that, and I failed to mention that. I would generally say because weather changes in time and space. It's the question was how far does the, do you, is the profiler wind information or radar information. Uh, bad wind information valid for you in, t in space, I would say generally 20 to 30 miles. Once you get further away from there, and, and that's, I'm going to throw this caveat at you too, if you're dealing with a change in air mass, so if you've got a boundary around or something like that, uh, you may have to adjust that accordingly based on where that, that change in, in atmospherics is. But 20 to 30 miles is a pretty reasonable estimate. 
More questions. Way in the back. <laughs> Somebody asked me that actually this morning. So the question was, is why am I not giving you the winds aloft at pilot briefing? And I'm going to do that for the rest of the week, but the reason I haven't been is because I've been trying to keep the pilot briefings as short as, and concise as possible, and we're shipping out that information to you via Remind, and we're also giving that wind information to you on the profiler data. But I will summarize it here from the, for the rest of the week out. Any other questions? Yes, up front. Yes, I agree with that. So the question was, is, is in the outflow discussion, uh, the, the winds basically change uh, here regularly on the surface, so it, you can't necessarily look in one direction, that basically. Uh, so that, and that's what's really tricky, uh, especially around here. And so that's why I, th I think the best way we're going to handle it uh, in the back office is, is if there is thunderstorms in the region in general, I'm going to start to look at where our winds are coming from on that particular morning that we're flying in the near surface layer, so the lowest 2,000 feet. If we happen to develop that drainage, I'm going to put a, a special emphasis on looking to the north. Or if we're just looking at a situation like we had today where the winds are going to be more out of the west, I'm going to be looking more towards, uh, more towards Arizona and western New Mexico to try to figure out if we had any thunderstorms over there overnight. And that's where I'm going to really put my focus on. Um, so basically when I fly, I always try to figure out my potential risks and I emphasize those when I'm looking at the data just a little bit more than everything else. So if it's thermals that I'm looking at because I'm flying on a hot summer day with very little wind, I'm going to make sure uh, that my, I have that temperature separation before I, before I pull the balloon out of the bag, that sort of thing. Any other questions? Wow, thank you guys very much. Thank you, Brad. Um, I just want to uh, point out that, uh, that the Quad A Education Committee is the one who puts on this seminar, but we also uh, put on two ground schools and sometimes three every year. We do a private pilot ground school, and it's a weekend, so it's really, really fast because we have a lot of people come from out of state, so we can't spread it out. Uh, we have a weekend gr private pilot ground school in February, a commercial ground school in April, and the last few years, our private ground school has not only filled up, but we've had a waiting list, and so we've done a second private ground school in June. So we, we've been a really tiny committee until the last couple of years. A lot of our committee members were working with you as you were coming in the door. Uh, most of us, not all of us, had a chance to do that, but a lot of us are wearing wearing shirts with a safety pin on them, and those are our committee members. We have a couple committee members that are even gonna be speaking later. Um, so we're still running a little bit behind, but we're gonna take about a 10 minute break. So if everyone will be back here at uh, two, about 2.25, we do have cookies out now. Uh, as I said, they're sponsored by the insurance companies. The cookies are over here where Don is, we had Evolution, Aviation Insur Insurance Resources, uh, and RPS IMC uh, that sponsored our cookies.